morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Morning Meditations. It's Pastor Peter here. I'm really excited to be with you today. Got my coffee. I am revved up, ready to go. And uh, I hope you're doing well out there in uh, Cedar Valley uh, or wherever you're uh, tuning in from. We had somebody from Tajikistan or Tajikistan. I don't even know how you how you say it exactly, but we have uh, people from all over that tune into this. So uh, I'd love to just know who you are, uh, where you're listening from. Uh, go ahead and drop a comment so we can say hi to you. And uh, just really glad you're here. By the way, public service announcement, it is Tuesday morning, just in case you were wondering. Uh, I know all of us are getting our days mixed together. So uh, this has just been a great time. I'm loving this a time to get together to encourage you, um, to it encourages me, uh, time to pray together. So again, drop a comment. Uh, if you're just coming into the video, uh, drop a comment. Let me know that you're watching. Um, and we did a, uh, a challenge on Sunday as a church at Trinity. We started a challenge and it's uh, just a one phone call a day kind of a challenge. What would it look like if everybody in our church family reached out to at least one person every day over the phone? And uh, we just talked about our design for relationship and um, I wonder how that's going. Uh, hopefully you're able to do that. Hopefully you're um, practicing that. I know for me, I, I, I get the phone out and I know who I'm going to call. And then it's just a little bit of like, a, uh, I'm going to call this person. Maybe I kind of secretly hope it goes to voicemail. <laughs> uh, but man, when I actually have that conversation, uh, it's so good. It's so encouraging. And uh, so I hope we're, I hope we're all doing that. Because I just think um, even if you don't need that encouragement, maybe that other person that you're calling does. So uh, welcome, Wendy, Brian, Mark, and Sydney. Uh, man, good to have all of you here and miss miss all of you. Uh, look forward to seeing you all face to face at some point. Uh, so uh, again, if you're new here on the chat, if you're just coming in, uh, go ahead and drop a comment. We'd love to just uh, say hi to you, uh, shout out to you and welcome you. Um, so here's our question, our, our, our deep question, uh, kind of to start us off this morning. If your house was burning down and you could salvage one item, what would that be? If your house was burning down and you could salvage one item, what would it be? Uh, for me, I have a, uh, a Taylor guitar, which is a way nice guitar for my guitar playing skills. Uh, by the way, that's kind of been my quarantine hobby that I've picked up a little bit. I've been playing a little more guitar lately, um, but I have this Taylor guitar. It's beautiful, uh, in great shape, and it's way more expensive than anything that I would ever buy as a guitar. Um, and, and by the way, I'm assuming with this question, I'm assuming that um, your kids are safe. I'm assuming your pets are safe. So uh, I'm not cold hearted that I'm picking a, a guitar over my, my kids. Uh, I'm assuming all of them are safe and uh, it's just physical possessions. And by the way, you can't say a pair of pants. I'm assuming that we're all wearing pants. All right. So uh, if there was one item that you had to rescue from your house, if it was burning down, you could take one thing with you. And by the way, I, I don't think you're supposed to do that. I think you're just supposed to leave the house. I don't think you're supposed to try to salvage something. But hypothetically, if you were to do that, uh, what would you grab? It would be my Taylor guitar that, uh, and actually the only reason that it's that important to me is it was Amy's dad's guitar. Uh, and so there's a sentimental value to it as well. So go ahead and drop that in the chat. Go ahead and uh, I hear someone saying my scrapbooks, man, those family memories, those family vacations, those uh, those summers, uh, when the kids were little, man, you can't, uh, get those memories back. So, uh, good, good call there, Wendy. And, um, a couple other people are commenting here. Well, uh, I'm excited to get into Luke chapter 12. I, I think this is probably this parable we're going to be looking at the parable of the rich fool is probably the most timely parable we could have for this COVID-19 crisis. Um, so go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 13. And I'm excited to just unpack this with you. I'll give you a moment. Uh, Tony says, my favorite hat. All right, there we go. Uh, by the way, I do have uh, my second possession that I would pick. Um, it's this little guy. This is Jasper. 
Say hi to Jasper. He's got his little uh, mask right now, his COVID mask going on. So I know you're thoroughly creeped out, but uh, <laughs> this is we found this in some old box of Amy's, and uh, now it just sits in our house. And when people come over for a small group, they're just like, who is that? <laughs> so, okay. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And uh, I'm excited to unpack this with you, the parable, the rich fool. It says, someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Uh, Friend, he said to him, who appointed me as judge or arbiter over you? He then told him, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told him a parable, a rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said, I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So what's happening here? Well, uh, there is this man that comes. He wants his inheritance. Uh, He wants a greater share of his inheritance. And um, he wants Jesus to settle this dispute. And Jesus, instead of directly kind of addressing this topic, he changes the subject here. He uses this as a teaching moment. It's a teachable moment to think about greed, to think about possessions, and to really get to the heart of the issue. I think um, uh, when when you say kind of the issue isn't the real issue, right? Uh, And that's often the case in our lives that the issues that we're upset about, the issues that we're irritated about, um, they're really not the real issue. Um, And Jesus recognizes that here. And he uses this as an opportunity to teach his listeners about greed. Um, about how we should relate to our possessions. Um, And so I just want to give a few observations here. I think there's kind of one key thought that I want to leave you with from this, but uh, just a few observations right off the bat here. First, it's, it's very apparent that money is not the problem. Wealth is not the problem here. Uh, But greed rather is the problem. Greed, uh, you could say is the excessive and consuming desire to have more possessions or wealth the excessive or consuming desire to have more possessions or wealth. And um, he explains to this man that, that, that this, you know, the life God designs for us has nothing to do with being uh, wealthy. It's not measured by how much we own. And when you think about it, that's the exact opposite of everything that we hear around us in our society. Uh, right? So you, you listen to advertisers, you listen to the people that are setting the trends in culture. They're not going to say, no, you don't really need that new car or no, you don't really need that new iPhone. Your two or three year old iPhone or smartphone is just fine. No, they're not going to say that because they want you to get the next thing. They want you to um, buy their product. Our whole society operates on creating a sense of discontent with what you have. Our whole society operates on this this, uh, idea of, of greed as our motivation. Um, and so that's that's often how we measure how good our lives are. Think about it. We measure our lives and how good our lives are by how much we have. Um, if someone has a big house or a mansion, uh, you just assume they have a good life, right? You just assume that, oh, they must they must have a great life. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, noticed the trend in like TV shows, right, where um, people live in these like mansion, massive kind of houses or these like immaculate apartments in downtown New York City in Manhattan. And there's no possible way they could afford that on a regular <laughs> salary of whatever their job is in the TV show. Um, but but it's just, I mean, there's this expectation that, man, you're just going to uh, have amazing stuff and you're going to have these awesome possessions and your life is going to be happy and you're not going to want for anything. And, and, and that's just kind of what we assume. We assume that if someone has stuff, if someone has possessions, 
then their life is taken care of. Uh, their their life is happy. That their their life is measured. Again, we measure um, ourselves by how much we have. And maybe we don't do it explicitly. Maybe we don't do it um, intentionally, even. But it's just so much of how our society operates. So uh, the the real question here: money isn't the problem. Greed is the problem. And so the real question for us is: how much is enough? Like literally, how much is enough? There was a rich man who was once asked that question. He said, well, just a little bit more. <laughs> um, so so what is that for us? Like how, how big of a house is enough? How nice of a car is enough? How much money in a savings account is enough? Is there ever an enough? And if there's not, then, and, and there's just a, oh, got to keep accumulating more and more and more and more. Um then that's where it gets into this place of greed, this excessive and consuming desire to have more wealth and possessions, just just building bigger and bigger barns, bigger and bigger barns. Um, and you could translate that into bigger and bigger savings accounts, bigger and bigger stock portfolios, um, bigger and bigger retirement accounts, whatever, whatever you want to translate that into. Um, I also notice here that just his focus on himself, right? Greed is this focus on oneself. Um, he uses the word I or my um, 12 times. Uh, I, I think I think I got my count right on that, that he, he talks about himself. The whole focus is on him. And, uh, and what about those around him? What about those that might be in need? What about those that um, in, in, his, in his family, those he, who he can serve and influence through his position and his wealth. Um, so that's just a, a basic thought. Money isn't the problem. Greed's the problem. Second thought for you, if our security is in our wealth, it's a false security. Uh, notice how um, in verse uh, 19, after he stores up all these goods for himself, all this grain, uh, he says to himself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. And it's good to enjoy what God's given us. The Bible talks about that. First Timothy six verse seventeen talks about you know God gives us all things uh, to enjoy, and so it's good to enjoy ourselves. But you get the sense from verse nineteen that he has this um, sort of inflated sense of security from the goods that he stored up. He thinks that he's in control. He thinks he has it made, and the reality is that none of us are in control. Uh, we really don't have control over much in life. We think we have control, but we really don't have control over much. And I think uh, for me, this is why this is so timely for us. Um, I, 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 there's no time greater than now where we're realizing this of just how little we actually control in life. Um, and, and when what we depend on for security and comfort is taken away, whether it's relationships that you know we can't engage in as much anymore, or whether it's our stock portfolios that have tanked, or whether it's um, the plans that we had for for our lives, the plans that we had for the next few months, whatever it is that we're kind of depending on for that security, for that comfort, when that's taken away and our lives are filled with uncertainty, it it, it really begins to expose our hearts. and And for a lot of us, we've had things stripped away. We've had maybe maybe finances jobs, um, plans that we had. I have, I have three couples right now that I'm, um, that have been trying to get married in the midst of this and, um, they've had their plans dashed. And so a lot of times the, the things that we look to for security, they're not bad in and of themselves, right? But they ultimately can't bring us that real security that we're looking for. So when those things go away, it's really kind of a test, isn't it? It's a test of, man, what were we really putting our hope in? Um, man, when I can't uh, be with people, was I putting my hope in my relationships? Was my security in my ability to be with people and find comfort with people? Or is my security in the Lord? Um, if, if I lose my job, and that's, I mean, that that's, that's a huge loss, a huge challenge. Um, but was my security in the ability to, to have a consistent job or, or is it in the Lord? And these aren't easy things to walk through. Again, I don't want to be flippant. Um, but the reality is that when 
the things that we put our trust in get taken away, uh, it begins to expose kind of what's what's inside us. And we either, and I've noticed this happened in myself, we either draw nearer to the Lord and we either seek God and we either uh, have a deeper spiritual hunger and need for him and, turn, and we go to him during those moments. Or we just kind of go into a despondency or we go into a kind of a, a mode of self-preservation of just trying to salvage whatever we can. Um, and so I don't know about you, but I think this time has really exposed some things in me that, that maybe there's some things that I just kind of let prop myself up in, in life um, that I let maybe bring me comfort in life in a way that maybe um, I, I shouldn't expect them to. Uh, and, and so if we don't have that kind of vibrant relationship with God, that deep re- abiding relationship with the Lord, it's, it's going to get exposed during this time. And so I, I hope for you, uh, as it has for me, I hope your spiritual hunger has increased during this time. I hope you've just had a, a hunger to be in God's word, a hunger to be in prayer, a hunger to be in fellowship, which is, I think, um, why you're, why you're here right now. And, uh, so I think just just for me, that's a key observation that when we look to things around us, possessions, wealth for security, um, whatever kind of things of this world, um, again, not bad things, but just things that aren't eternal, um, when they go away, what's left? Um, last observation that I got kind of a, a global thought for you to take, take away. Um, we never know when it's our time. <laughs> we never know when it's our time. This is so clear in this passage. I mean, God says in verse 20, this very night your life is demanded of you. And so not only not only did this man die, but there's a sense here when his life is demanded of him. There's a sense that, and it talks about then, uh, the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Um, there's a sense in which he was prepared for the future in this life, but he wasn't prepared to stand before God. His life was demanded of him. He had to answer for his life and his possessions were just you know, passed on to someone else. Um, so in first Timothy six, seven through eight, uh, Paul says, we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. We brought nothing into this world. We can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Um, I shared this story in a sermon recently, but I'm going to tell it again in case you weren't there, but about a year ago, a year and a half ago, Amy and I moved into a new house, into this house. And the owners of this house, they were in their 80s and 90s. They passed away. Uh, so before we could move in, they had this huge estate sale. And this is, I mean, I had never seen so much stuff in one house. Like uh, there was a whole room, the whole attic was full of Santa figurines. Anywhere from like six feet high to, to like this size. Um so <laughs> I had to get him in there again. Um, so it was chock full of Santa Fe. There was a whole uh, like back porch that was full of yarn. Like, hey, fill up a bag with as much yarn as you can stuff it in. And it's like, it was like a buck. Uh, so, I mean, they just had the whole house jam packed. And um, we went through the estate sale two or three times just, you know, because there were some pieces that we just thought, hey, we'll just buy them and leave them in the house. Um but at the end, about a day or two after this estate sale, uh, we drove by just kind of, you know, creeping, looking at the house, you know, here's our future home and w- what's going on today with it. And, and it was raining. It was kind of a miserable day. And there was a trailer with a, a big, big old pickup truck uh, parked in front of the house, big flatbed trailer. And they were carrying out uh, 55 gallon bags from the house and piling it up on the trailer. I mean, it was just bag after bag after bag. And I don't know how many loads they had to haul out of the house, but it was a jarring picture. I mean, it was sobering (laughs) to be like, this is what happens to our stuff at the end of our life. Um, All the things that maybe you obsess over, all the things that you focus on gathering and collecting, um, at the end of the day, it's all going to be hauled away, like all the stuff that nobody wants which was quite a bit in that house, it's going to be hauled away to a landfill. And man, does that put life in perspective? Um, does that put into perspective the, the focus on possessions 
versus the focus on things that, as he says in here, um, are eternal. Store up treasure for yourself, he says. Uh, he says, this is how it is for one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So I want to just take you to one simple question um, to end this meditation. What do you spend more time preparing for? Your earthly future or your eternal future? What do you spend more time preparing for? Your earthly future or your eternal future? It's not bad to plan for your earthly future. Uh, it's The two aren't mutually exclusive, right? You can be a good steward. Uh, the Proverbs teaches us to consider the ant, right, who stores away seeds for winter. Uh, life insurance is good. Retirement accounts are wise. It's okay to enjoy life. Again, 1 Timothy 16 or 617 says that, you know, God provides all things for us to, to richly to, for us to enjoy. But at the same time, we got to understand that we're only going to live a few short years in this earth. So how much more important is it for us to plan for our eternal future? First, do you have a relationship with God through Jesus? Have you come to him? Have you confessed your sins? Have you received forgiveness that only Jesus can provide so that when you stand before God on that day, it's not just your own um, works that you're bringing to God because those will never justify you before God. You have to answer. Well, all of us have to answer for our lives. And if all we have to answer for our lives is like, well, you know, like I went to church and you know, I, I did some good things for the poor and I volunteered a little bit and, you know, I, I tried not to sin that much. If that's what we're bringing to God, man, that is not going to, to justify us. That's not going to justify us in light of our sin. What we need is Jesus to justify us before God. We need to put our trust in him and what he's done to pay for our sins so that we can be justified as we stand before God. So are we prepared for that day, first of all? Are we prepared to stand before God uh, and his throne? But then are we, are we investing in the things that truly matter for eternity? Are we investing in the kingdom of God advancing? So what do we spend more time preparing for? Do we spend more time preparing for our earthly future or for our eternal future? And I think the best analogy I could think of with this is of a bride preparing for a wedding. And for, for brides that are getting ready, I mean, it's, a, it's amazing to see how much energy and effort goes into. Like I said, there's been three weddings that I've uh, been a part of that have basically had to be canceled uh, because of this epidemic. But, um, uh, you know, all the preparations and all of the time and all of the dresses and the flowers and the venues and the food and the, you know, think about everything that goes into that, that event of the wedding and all the preparations that go into it. And they spend months and months preparing for this wedding. And, and, and when that weekend comes, that wedding weekend, when it comes around, there's two events, right? There's, there's the rehearsal and there's the wedding. And for, for all of the couples that I've seen, you know, the rehearsal is kind of a last minute. It's kind of, it's kind of thrown together. You know, you, it's, it's the in-laws, the, the groom's parents that uh, are usually in charge of it. So, you know, there's not super high standards. Uh, they can, cater in Chick-fil-A or something if they want, or do homemade barbecue. And, and nobody puts all that much effort into dressing up, uh, you know, for, for at my, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed at my uh, rehearsal. It was everything Amy could do to get me to not wear jeans at my rehearsal. And I remember our, our rehearsal dinner, you know, it's kind of like last minute. Hey, what do you think? Like a week beforehand, hey, what should we do? What should we have? We've got all these, you know, family coming. And, and it's just kind of thrown together. And, but, but imagine a wedding right? Where instead of putting all of her effort into planning the wedding, the bride puts all of her effort into planning the rehearsal <laughs> and the rehearsal dinner. And, and all of the months and months and months of planning are, are in the rehearsal. And then the wedding's the afterthought. And that's kind of what we do. And we focus on preparing for our earthly future, but not our, our eternal future. Because this, this life is just the rehearsal, right? This life is nothing compared to the big event of eternity. So I want to read for you the rest of uh, this section in Luke, because I think this next section really dovetails with this parable that we've just studied. So uh, starting in verse 22, just kind of follow along with me these next 12 verses or so. Uh, then he said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat 
or about the body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than the birds? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? If then you are not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass, which is in its field today and uh, in the field today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow, how much more will he do for you, you of little faith? Don't strive for what you should eat and what you should drink, and don't be anxious. For the Gentile world eagerly seeks all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your Father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that grow, won't grow old, an inexhaustible treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's take some time to pray and um, just thank God for his word. Thank God for these truths and just to pray for the needs that are um, that you might have or, or that are in our community right now. So go ahead and drop a prayer request. Uh, please feel free to share. Um, I'd love to pray for you this morning. I'd love to pray for any, any needs that you have. Um, but let's go to God in prayer. Lord, what a humbling parable just to understand that we put so much energy and effort into this life and yet how quickly that can be taken from us. And we certainly understand that in this season, God. And uh, But there's a greater truth that, um, that there is an eternity that we're called to store up treasure for. Uh, that there is a future that we have, and that's why we have hope in this season. Um, and that's why our hope isn't in what we have in this life. And so we thank you that that you've given us an eternal future to look forward to, God. And um, I pray that we would just have that mindset, have an eternal perspective, God, as we look at life um, now, but also in the months after this, because I anticipate, Lord, that there's going to be a time where we go back to normal, whatever that means. And it's going to be easy to forget some of these lessons that we've maybe learned, some of these um, things that we've had to wrestle with. And But I thank you that your word is timeless. Your word speaks to us in every season. And so, God, help us to remember this parable um, in the months to come uh, today, but in the months to come and to to just uh, not put our hope in the things of this world, to not treasure our earthly possessions uh, above the, the eternal value of being in your presence and investing in what matters for eternity. And so God, I know that there are needs uh, of in, in our church family. I know there are needs in our community. I know that there are um, needs for, for those who are with me on this uh, live stream today. And I just pray for your hand of blessing. I pray for your hand of protection, God. I pray that you would provide. I thank you for what we just read, that you are, you know exactly what we need. And so when we come and pray to you, you're not surprised. You know what we need. You know um, what we are going to ask before we even ask it. And so we still come to you. We still pray. Um, that you will meet those needs and provide in those different ways, God. And, um, but God, we also just know that you are fully capable and able, um, to provide. So we, we put our trust in you, God. Um, I pray for those who have lost jobs. I pray for those who are in between jobs, I pray for those who are looking for jobs. Um, I pray that you would provide for them. God, I pray for those who, are working in the medical fields and, and who are in high risk uh, areas or who are working in retail or who are working in various places where uh, they're going to be exposed to a lot of people. I pray that you would protect them. God, I pray that you would keep them safe. Uh, God, I pray for those who um, are sick right now. I pray for those who have family members who have sick or who are, who are sick 
And I pray just for healing, God. I pray for restoration of their bodies. And uh, in all of this, God, we, um, we don't understand why, but we understand that you are good, that you are sovereign, and, and we trust you. Um, and, uh, and help us, God, today and in the days to come, to have an eternal perspective as we go about our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, man, it's so good to be with you. Uh, really enjoyed this. Really enjoyed spending time with you, being in God's word. Uh, I hope you're encouraged today. I hope you get a chance to get into God's word for yourself. Uh, that, that spiritual hunger, I, I just pray that God is uh, building that up in your heart and that you um, are just going to him during this time, going to his word. And then make a phone call. Encourage someone this week. Don't forget that. And uh, we'll see you here tomorrow. God bless.